I do. I'd like to do an acknowledgement to country because Farmers for Climate Action acknowledges the traditional owners of the land on which we work. In my particular case, it's Wiradjuri land. Uh, it was never ceded and the, we also acknowledge the traditional owners of land, of the land of our guests and where our speakers are joining us from. Um, I'm not entirely sure which land that would be. Andrew is coming from the ACT and Joshua and is coming from Gold Coast. So I'm not sure what they are. Um, we would also like to pay our respects to elders past and present and particularly to any emerging Indigenous elders, uh, leaders. Um, I think it's important to support them in, in the work that they do. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Miguel after I introduce him, Miguel. Miguel is the lead author on our latest report from Ernst & Young, that is how can Australian agricultural sector realise opportunities in a low emission future. Miguel is passionate about working with organisations seeking to create positive impacts on the environment and the community through strategies, initiatives and programs. He has nine years experience in consultancy on climate change and outcomes management with a focus on decarbonisation and natural capital. Over the last six years, Miguel has worked on projects for a wide range of industry sectors, including mining, transport, energy, agriculture and tourism. Now, Miguel is, um, well, we're blessed to have him here today because he's not feeling all that well. So he's brought along Joshua Stevens, who is his assistant and probably slightly more engaged in some of the technical details. So if there's questions about um, certain aspects, we'll hand over to uh, Joshua to take those, but otherwise Miguel will give the delivery. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Miguel. Thank you. Excellent, perfect. Thanks everyone. Um, and thanks Peter. Um, very, very delighted to be here and present um, to a deep dive on the analysis that we did for Farmers for Climate Action. Um, as Peter mentioned, uh, um, I also have my colleague Joshua Stevens, who was deeply involved in the research and stakeholder engagement process of the report. Um, and so we'll be more than happy to um, take any any questions um, and answer them at the end. Um, so, in terms of the in terms of the report. Um, I think uh, so. The main purpose of the report was to provide a to to influence the political narrative um, to ultimately secure a more stable climate for Australian agriculture and how to how to um, get the agriculture sector involved in the conversations in, around climate change and, and especially in line with the COP twenty six happening in November. Um, which we understand that based on the media response and feedback from industry, the report has been received um, pretty well. And we're, we're pleased to see how FCA is contributing to construct an open dialogue um, with the government towards a low carbon economy. Um, probably um, you've seen the, the launch of the, the report a couple of, of uh, weeks ago, and so I'm not gonna present again on, 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 those, um, on those slides, and you've probably seen the report already. Um, the, the pathway is that, that we develop is only the first step um, and demonstrate how the ag sector will play a fundamental role in the decarbonisation transition to, for the whole economy. Um, however, there are more steps after this, um, after this piece of work. Um, the main objective of the report has been achieved, which is amazing. Um, but in terms of what does that mean for, for farmers and for different subsectors is probably the next step. So um, we would like to unpack a little bit of the, of the practices and technology that farmers can adopt in the short and long term. Um, and probably doing a deep dive would take a, a, a little bit of, um, um, it, it will be undertaken over the next couple of months. However, uh, we'll be very, very happy to share some of the preliminary views and thoughts that we gathered do, during this engagement and how can farmers in the industry could get involved um, in the first instance. Um, 
before before I jump into into those um, kind of examples or where, uh, preliminary thoughts on this, um, I would like to um, step you through very quickly on the on the approach and, and the steps and the steps that we took um, to complete this this work. Um, which there are mainly five five different steps. So the first one was to collect the um, available data and reports about the abatement opportunities, and um, and understanding the marginal abatement cost, which assists us to determine um, a cost effective pathway for um, to to get to uh, to a low carbon transition. Essentially, um, so we look at the, at different available data from government data um, from government websites. Um, scientific papers and a few other reports from think tanks as well, um, and then we shortlisted some of the some of the most feasible initiatives based on that literature review, um, which were then tested with some of the key um, some of the, some of the key big bodies and and, and other stakeholder groups. Um, so we were um, we had a few different workshops with um, organisations like NFF MLA. There Australia, Pork Australia, Grain Growers, the Carbon Market Institute, and a few others to essentially challenge and, and, and collect the different views that the sector could have on particular technologies. Um, we understand that there, there, there's a little bit of a reliance on future technologies, especially from the methane perspective, coming online towards the end of this decade. Um, so understanding different perspectives and the, and the feasibility was very useful and helpful to come up to mid, to, to, to identify a middle ground um, for the sector as a whole. So for the, for the whole ag sector as a whole to, um, to have, a, have a target to work towards to. Um, something that we um, identify as well during this stakeholder engagement was that the different targets floating around from different organizations like Pork, Pork Australia by um, um, achieving or having a goal by 20, uh, net zero by 2025, um, the red meat industry having um, a goal by 2030, um, and NFF by 2050 as a whole economy, as a net zero. So bringing this paper together um, was a, a stepping stone to uh, to have the sector into on the same page, hopefully, to um, to to keep the conversation flowing um, about um, about transitioning and, and, as I said, how farmers can get involved in this. Um, and so we refined the, the results and then come up with it with a pathway for a final um, for a final feedback. So I guess in terms of the generally speaking, um, in terms of what farmers could consider now. Um, one of the big opportunities that we see is the involvement in carbon markets um, as they mature. So um, the, the emission reduction fund or the, or the climate solution fund now um, has, has come a long way and there are a lot of methodologies. There's some complexities on, the, on, on, how, on how to participate on those, um, onto, those um, onto the market. Um, there's some costs associated, there's some auditing requirements um, and so getting involved in, in understanding how the how you can apply those methodologies to your activities will be will be one of the key key steps because um, we think that the, the carbon market will continue to mature and there's going to be another additional um, revenue streams on top of carbon like biodiversity that I'm sure um, Andrew McIntosh will expand a little bit more on that on the biodiversity um, core benefits. Um, and I'm also based in Queensland and have been working very closely with the Land Restoration Fund, um, which has a similar scheme in terms of identifying those core benefits. So anything that is, um, any core benefit that could be associated with a carbon revenue stream is, is an additional opportunity um, for, for farmers. So specifically on those activities that are related to land management and, um, and land use change, um, defor and, and reforestation, that sort of replanting space as well. So that, that's one of the big opportunities that we think here. The other one is, the other thing that we're seeing in the market is, um, especially from the finance um, 
for organizations um, is around providing sustainable finance products. So banks are getting uh, are starting to support more and more um, the, the different activities. So that we we acknowledge that there is still some, and they the, the banks also acknowledge there's some um, gaps in the data for them to understand and how to um, recognize um, carbon projects as, as an additional revenue instead of liabilities and things like that. But we start seeing some. Um, movement towards a more sustainable finance products. And we, we've seen that this year through the Stokia and CBA example that enter into a sustainability link loan for the next three years where they need to report on key metrics to get a premium um, on the, on the um, a preferable rate. Um, if that's not, I think that's a very novel, um, Noble mechanism, and we, we think that the other banks will follow suit as well. Um, so, in terms of um, in terms of methane reduction as well. So, as part of the report, we categorize those different um, the, the pathway into four different themes, and one of them is the methane reduction. As as, as I was saying before, um, there, there's a lot of research on methane reduction from the anti-methane vaccines and the feed lots and things like that, and sorry, and feed supplements. Um, and so we understand that there's a little bit of um, a learning curve still to to be uh, to to go through, and also the adoption curve to to get through those. Um, but supporting and getting involved in those type of research that. Um, MLA is conducting and a few other organizations will be will be something very very important um, and while that that is on the way there's also uh, things around reducing time to market and selective breeding that um, that the livestock um, industry could investigate a little bit further on um, the other one that, that we have uh, is the transfer and electricity so obviously, to, to a large extent, the grid is decarbonizing or reducing those emissions over time. Um, probably not at the rate that um, that some of us would would like to. Um, but there's a, there's an opportunity on cost parity for renewables and in having the, the the adoption of renewables um, at a farm level will be will be something important and something for farmers to get ahead of the curve in terms of monetizing those. Um, um, those savings from from renewables. Um, similarly to my previous comment, financial providers are also looking for more favorable on farm management, like um, for transport specifically. So we believe that over the next few years, probably towards the, the second half of this decade, um, more opportunities will come online on financial um, or tax incentives related to to low carbon technology, which could be another another thing to consider as well. Um, finally, in terms of the land use change and improved land management, one of the things that we uh, that we think that the farmers could start thinking about is um, having a strategic view on the selection of tree species and the use of methods like um, mixed native species planting to enhance, um, obviously, to sequester carbon, but also um, get the most benefit of all the environmental core benefits, as I mentioned before. Um, and just to be clear um, on this, um, on reforestation and replanting, this is not something that um, farmers will be locking, um, locking up any, any land. So it will be um, creating those um, shelter, shelter belts and things like that, that suit your operation. And so you, you, you can select which uh, blocks of land are the most feasible one for this type of project. Um, and to, to, to the next point here would be around, obviously, as I, as I mentioned before, the, the complexities in participating on carbon markets and probably the multiple options for, um, from uh, hopefully the expansion of the carbon plus biodiversity pilot, um, but other, other state led programs like in WA. Um, Victoria here in Queensland, you have all the state-led programs that um, could be another option and sometimes could be a little bit daunting to navigate through all of that. So um, 
potentially getting in touch with carbon brokers or aggregators to get that information into how to participate in those programs and what are the considerations and opportunities under each one of them. So what makes the most sense to your business and based on location activities and so on um, will be will be will be important as well. Um, and, and obviously attached to this, whether identifying whether there's, there's any other core benefits applicable into this context um, to, um, to around any climate resilience or biodiversity enhancements. Um, so, sorry, conscious of time. I think that's, that's probably the key high level um, comments that I wanted to make today about the, about the report. Um, more than happy to take any questions um, towards the end of the, of the call. Thank uh, you thanks. So much. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Miguel. Um, I'll just um, make the, the point that uh, um, Joshua is already answering some um, more pertinent questions in the, in the Q&A. So if anybody wants to check that out, the answers are there. Um, I'll now move on. We will we'll do questions at the end, but I'll, I'll move on now to, um, to Andrew. Um, now, Professor McIntosh is an environmental law and policy expert at the Australian National University. He is one of Australia's preeminent experts on climate change mitigation and adaption, particularly in relation to the land and forest sectors and the management of elevated risk of bushfires, coastal hazards associated with climate change. His research is widely published in respected international journals, including Nature Climate Change, Global Climate, uh, Global Change Biology, Climatic Change, and the Journal of Environmental Law. In 2012, Professor McIntosh was awarded the Schlamdinger Prize for Climate Change Research. Professor McIntosh is currently the Director of Research at the ANU Law School. His previous roles included being Chair of Domestic Offsets Integrity Commission uh, Committee, an Associate Member of the Climate Change Authority, a Member of the Emissions Reduction Fund Expert Reference Group, and a Director of the Port of Newcastle. Professor McIntosh is leading research, is leading in the research of the Federal Government's Carbon and Biodiversity Pilot, and I guess that is going to be a fair part of his discussion today because many people talk about it a lot. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Professor McIntosh. Thank you. Thanks very much. And hello, everybody. I was about to say good morning, good afternoon. Um, really great to be with you. As that uh, blurb on me suggested, we're currently working with the Federal Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment on the Agricultural Stewardship Program. I, I've got a number of colleagues that are working with me, including Don Butler, Dean Ansell, uh, Marie Washka, David Lindemeyer, uh, Phil Gibbons. Uh, there's a bit of a mob of us, and we are helping the department both designing and administering uh, the program. There's four key elements of it that I thought you might be interested in. The first one's the Carbon Plus Biodiversity Pilot, which has attracted a lot of interest. The next one is a thing called the Enhancing Remnant Vegetation Pilot, which as it, uh, as it so happens, uh, went live about an hour and a half ago. Uh, the third bit is a thing called the Australian Farm Biodiversity Certification Scheme. And the final element of it is a, uh, an environmental markets trading platform. I'll just walk you through those four elements and um, open up for questions after I've finished. So the, the Carbon Plus Biodiversity Pilot is what it says it is. It's a, a program that provides uh, biodiversity co-payments for farmers who undertake environmental planting projects on their properties in accordance with protocols that are designed to ensure that those plantings provide benefits for biodiversity. These plantings are not necessarily biodiverse plantings. They, they, the, the program's been designed to support plantings that provide benefits for biodiversity. That distinction is important. Um, we, we've done a number of things to design this to help farmers and to help them engage in the program. Um, these include the fact that all the applications are done fully online and the online tool, which you can see at agsteward.com.au includes project planning tools and allows you to go to your property 
to draw polygons around areas you might be interested in planting to get immediately get information back on how much that you're likely, how much carbon you're likely to sequester in those areas through environmental plantings over 25 years under average climate conditions. Um, also gives you annual estimates and, and all those estimates are derived pixel by pixel using 25 by 25 metre pixels. So it's, it's quite an accurate approach. It's based exactly straight off what the government uses. Um, so it's a, a fairly reliable estimate for, for project planning purposes. The other thing we do is that unlike a number of programs, we're actually designed the program so the government gives participants or applicants an offer. So they generate a price offer and then offer it to the farmer and basically saying, um, here's the amount we're willing to, to pay you as a biodiversity co-payment to undertake this project. Um, the thinking there was in a lot of these programs they open it up and expect the farmer to bid in. Um, having had experience on that side of the ledger, I know that's often hard for farmers because these markets are really novel. Not a lot of people have a lot of experience in them and, and picking a price point is often difficult. So to deal with that issue, we've, we've designed this process whereby you we provide you an offer and that offer is meant to, in an in a optimal project, is meant to give you a prescribed rate of return. So you get get a return off capital and a return on capital. Um, I should note there that that accounts for the revenues you're likely to receive from your carbon credits. Um, the other thing we did in designing the program to make it farmer friendly is that rather than offering people contracts that bound them to immediately undertake the projects, we're using options contracts. So if you are successful and you get an offer under the program, you get an options contract. Uh, you have to exercise that option over six months. The option is the option to initiate a project and receive the co-payment. Again, the idea of making it as simple as possible. We also went to great lengths to design the planting protocols. That's the rules you have to follow if you undertake one of these projects to design them in a way that is simple and easy to understand. And we also tried to align the emissions reduction fund requirements with our requirements and provide a consolidated table so you can literally go through and tick them all off. Um, the other thing that we managed to persuade certain players in the government uh, to agree to was to waive the third party audit requirements for projects that are under the C plus B pilot. As any of you uh, who've been associated with the Emissions Reduction Fund would know, audit costs can be very significant and they can be very, very detrimental to the, to the returns from small environmental planning projects. So if, if you undertake a C plus B pilot project and you use the generic block planting calibration under the model, it's full cam, it's called full cam, then there are no third party audit requirements. Um, you might say, doesn't that leave the program vulnerable to bad projects? I would say absolutely not. Um, the ANU and our partners, being our NRM groups who are playing with us, will be doing rotational surveys of all the projects that participate in this pilot on a roughly three year basis. So all the projects are going to be visited, it's just that the project proponent, the farmer, doesn't have to pay for that. That is internalised by government and we lower cost because we're doing it in, in rotational rounds and we do it through standardised processes. Um, so it, the, the first round of that ran uh, through around April. Um, we had pretty good uptake. It only ran in six NRM regions, natural resource management regions, being Burnett, Mary in Queensland, Central West in New South Wales, North Central in Victoria, Northern in Tasmania, Air Peninsula in South Australia, and Southwest in Western Australia. The NRM groups have been fantastic, wonderful partners in this, in this program. And we really hope that by doing this, we build their capability in order to help you, the farmer, undertake um, any ERF project, but particularly, hopefully, future carbon plus biodiversity projects. Um, that's all I can really report on the C plus B pilot, other than to say we are very, uh, we very much hope that the pilot will be running in more NRM regions over the next 12 months. We're really keen to do that. We want to give other farmers who are not in one of those six regions the opportunity to participate. We also want to give the farmers in those regions another opportunity to, to play because we are sure there's others who'd be interested in doing this. I suppose one last thing I should say is that these projects are relatively small. They have to be between five and 200 hectares. So we're not talking about 
large displacement of prime agricultural land. The program has been exclusively designed to try and target those areas that are unproductive, um, those areas that are degraded, and those areas where plantings can complement agricultural production rather than, rather than displace it. Um, the next program on the list was the Enhancing Remnant Vegetation Pilot, which as I said before, just went live today. If you are in one of those six regions I just mentioned, you've now got the opportunity to be paid over 10 years to protect and enhance the condition of remnant vegetation on your property. Um, that program, again, all applications are done online. Go to Ag... Uh, Ag might be interested in terms of the, the protection enhancement of remnant veg on your properties. Um, the, 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 the pricing arrangements under the Enhancing Remnant Vegetation Pilot are not dissimilar to the Carbon Plus Biodiversity Pilot. That is, we will be generating offers and making offers to farmers. Um, those offers are based on two things. There's a, a rental component of the payment and there's a a management activity component. The rental activity, the rental component is essentially a proxy for a rental payment to use your land for conservation purposes over the 10 year period. We base it on an estimate of land value and then generate, you can see on the, on the portal, you can actually see what the land values are. If you draw your polygons around the areas you're interested in protecting, it'll throw you back an estimate or indicative estimate of that rental amount that you'll be paid every year. The amount that you see immediately on the site is an estimate of the first year rent. After the first year rent is set, then it will be increased by 3.5% each year to account for inflation. On the activity management side, if you're doing one of these pilot projects, you have to undertake one of five selected management activities, being enhanced grazing control, enhanced uh, pest control, enhanced weed control, infill planting, or re vegetation. Um, the idea is that the management activity component will cover the costs of those activities. So you end up with a rental component, activity, uh, a management activity component, add them together, that's the amount that you will get. Um, with the management activity component, it's important to emphasise the idea there is if you're undertaking activities with significant upfront costs, so for example, you're putting in significant fencing or you're putting in significant water points to allow you to exclude livestock from an area, then you'll get a significant amount of the money upfront. What we'd ideally like to ensure is that you basically get all of that money upfront to cover the upfront establishment you don't have to go and see your local bank manager and take a loan in order to cover those costs. I'm hoping that's very attractive to farmers because one of the things we got clearly back from farmers in relation to the Carbon Plus Biodiversity Pilot is that there are a number of farmers that don't want to take loans, they want to take on more debt in order to finance these sorts of activities. They're quite understandably um, anxious about taking debt where they don't fully understand the nature of the market and we fully understand that, hence the way we've designed the ERV. I'll quickly move on now because I don't. I know that time is ticking away. Um, the, the third thing was the biodiversity certification scheme. I'll just say on that is that that is in the works. We hopefully to be launching um, the first bit of that over the next month to, to two months. Um, the idea there is to give farmers the opportunity to be certified as being biodiversity friendly. That'll be based on a, on a biodiversity scoring system and a vegetation condition scoring sim system that is very similar to the ones we use in both the C plus B and ERB pilots to rank projects. Um, the, the basic threshold for certification is that the condition of the, of the vegetation for biodiversity on your farm has to be above the regional average. Um, that's subject to some caveats, but that's the general idea. We want to basically reward those or recognise those farmers who have done a good job in, in, uh, in managing their land in the past and want to do a good job going forward. Um, but we recognise that, uh, that you've got to basically peg that standard against your region. And we also peg it according to the capability or the land use of, of your property and vegetation type. So if you have high quality land that you're using for grazing or using for cropping, then um, we don't compare you against a farm who, farmer who might have 
less arable land and as a consequence has less native vegetation. We do a like for like comparison between um, farmers in your region with the similar land mix that you have and similar vegetation types and then get that average and make a comparison. Um, the fi final element of what we're doing in that is this environmental markets trading platform. Now, this is somewhat of a misnomer when you hear the word trading, you might think that, is a, that it is only a trading platform and that the idea is to provide an exchange whereby farmers can, um, can sell and, and others can buy environmental services from farmers. It, it's true that we're trying to build a, a domain on that platform that will help farmers and provide a place where farmers can sell their environmental services to others, but we're trying to do a lot, a lot more than that. And really the key things I thought that might be interest in, of interest to this audience is we're trying to provide um, good project planning tools for carbon projects and biodiversity projects. So this way, rather than having to go to a service provider to do geospatial mapping, for example, you'll be able to do it in a user-friendly way on the site we are creating. And again, go to that agsteward.com.au site that'll give a feel for the sorts of tools and how user-friendly we're trying to make them. Um, we're trying to make sure that, that when you do that project planning that you get um, really usable information on, on the returns you might get from a project and how you might place and design a project. Um, we're also ultimately trying to create processes that allow for effectively end-to-end -end automation of all of those things that make people want to put their heads through a wall when they consider engaging in these sorts of processes. So applications, reporting, measurements, and ultimately even possibly verification all done online and to the extent possible automated to reduce the transaction costs and reduce the time that you farmers need to spend wasting time filling out paperwork. I think I'll probably stop questions that people might have about any of those comments. They're really excited about them and they only work though if people like yourself get involved. Uh, thank you. Andrew, we've been having a little bit of um, trouble with with uh, the internet. I'm not sure if it's mine or your end, but um, you were dropping in and out. I hope I'm still working. Um, so I'll just check uh, somehow. Somebody give me a wave if they can hear what I'm saying. <laughs> yep. Right, good. Um, all right, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start with some questions then. Um, I'll start with a, a one that I get a lot. Um, from Jonathan, it seems that many many of the proposed strategies don't fit small and medium farms. Wondering if you consider any specific size in your model. So I guess that's to you, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to target this to small to medium sized farms. Um, so that five to 20 hectare threshold for projects is what we're after. Um, for the certification scheme, it's, it should be basically blind to size. We don't care what size you are. Um, so it's fully open, but those, the, the carbon plus biodiversity pilot and the enhancing room and vegetation pilot are very much targeted at the small to medium sized farms and obviously that even the smaller end of the project scale. In the future, we want to lift that, that, uh, that 200 hectares to something that's, that's above that, possibly to 500 hectares or even possibly 1000 hectares to accommodate the greater range of project types. Um, but it is, as I said, very much targeted small to medium sized projects. We're trying to cost the projects and generate price offers that make these projects um, profitable for, for farmers to undertake. Uh, and we're trying to design those systems that application, reporting, measurement, verification, that end to end process to, to accommodate the needs of small and medium sized farm businesses. There's just a bit of a follow-up on that question. Um, is there any capacity to um, for farms to get into groups on a regional scale and do it that way? Uh, at, at the moment, you can do aggregated projects across multiple properties, but you run into complications primarily because of the, uh, the emissions reduction fund. And it's really about your eligible interest holder consents. So if you want to take any sequestration project, so any tree related project or soil related project under the ERF, you need to have eligible interest holder consents. They are consents of anybody with an interest in your land. Uh, if you cross over multiple properties and you have a combined project, then what you end up with is multiple players with multiple eligible interest holder consents. And also it means that effectively you are all liable 
if one of your members breaches right. and they knock down their trees. Okay, that would be a problem. Uh, all right, um, next question from Gillian Heyman. Uh, is there an opportunity for retrospective payments for those who have done a lot of revegetation work already? The pilot and the emissions reduction fund, the short answer is no. No. <laughs> um, if, if the plantings are already there, you've already done that work. Um, unfortunately, you are, you are not eligible. You're excluded on the basis that it's not additional. Um, for the enhancing remnant vegetation pilot, we can accommodate you if you've done that work in the past and you can include it as part of your, your project, your ERV project, if it meets the definition of remnant vegetation. If it still hasn't achieved the composition and structure of the remnant vegetation, um, or it's unlikely to achieve it in the next 20 years, then you can't include it. But if you meet that, if you meet that broad definition, you can. Yeah. Um, now, Thomas has asked, which procedure is recommended for natural capital assessment? Um, I'm not entirely sure what that means, but um, I guess your website deals with that, does it? It doesn't at the moment in terms of uh, natural capital accounting. No, there's, there's a number of, of different groups that are working on this. Probably the one that's most advanced is a group called Accounting for Nature. They, they provide a way to, 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 to assess the condition of environmental assets, but it's not full um, natural capital accounting. It's only about accounting for extent and condition of relevant environmental assets. Um, but there, there are a number of a number of other outfits that are out there working on this. Miguel might actually know and have more details. Uh, I know of a number of the groups, but I'm not in a position to 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 give any comment about about where they're up to or the status of it. Yeah, um, I, I was gonna I was coming on that on the nature uh, accounting for nature framework and the econ how they um, value um, natural assets, but um, I think they're still um, there's still a little bit of standardization to do over the different programs um, running across different states and, and federal government. Um, yeah, I was going to suggest the same way, the, the same one as you, Andrew. Right. Um, now, I have a bit of a question linked into climate change from Rachel Clark at NRM, NRM Regions Australia. The CPA, C plus B project looks at carbon sequestration under average conditions. Given climate change means we're not generally experiencing average conditions, is this exposing farmers to risk throughout the year, throughout the 25 year permanence period? Either McGill or Andrew? Yeah, the, the, look, the, the, the projections that are on, on our, our portal are based on average climate conditions, but the pilot itself is not based on average climate conditions. Um, the participants in these projects who undertake environmental planning projects will need to uh, account for and measure their emissions using the government's full carbon accounting model, full can. Um, that model accounts for changes in rainfall. So if you have a stint of dry years, effectively you'll have less tree growth, so you'll get fewer credits. Um, and uh, in terms of has the pilot accounted, fully accounted for climate change in its design, I would say that we've done what we think we could uh, there's definitely clear guidance in the planning protocols for farmers to consider climate change to ensure that they plant species that, uh, that, that, that account for potential changes in climate over the next 25 or, or, or even longer period. Um, and beyond that, uh, farmers who participate need to be aware that if they undertake plantings and those plantings die, and uh, we're not talking about sort of natural attrition of plantings as the as the forest thins. We're talking about whole areas experiencing significant mortality. Then there is a chance they may need to to replant at some points or um, re-stratify the carbon estimation areas or their planting areas to carve out those areas that that have died. And if that happens and they've received credits for it, they're going to have to give back credits to account for the areas. Um, that have been carved out. So it is a risk. These projects are not zero risk. They should be looked upon as like, like any commercial enterprise or commercial undertaking that forms part of a farm business. Their risk is so associated with them and people need to be cognizant of that when they engage in them. Okay. Um, now this one might be from Miguel, I think. It's from Carol. 
from Mount Barker. <clears throat> Why has the AMRC, the Australian Meat Research Committee, I think it is, um, and other industry organisations promised the government that greenhouse gas emissions, that is methane, will be greatly reduced by higher growth rates, selective breeding and shorter life. This is insane when the highest emissions are from cattle feedlots, which the government and industry is supporting. We are grass fed beef producers 40 plus years and want to have our animals killed, processed locally, not trucked to feedlots for poisoning on grain of the last hundred years. And there's a lot of emotive language in that, but we'll work through that and uh, try and get an answer. Miguel? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Carol. Um, I think, um, I think I think you're right. So there's not one um, one solution for for everyone. I think there's some advantages and disadvantages from every single technology, um, from feed supplement, um, um, even at a feed slot, um, 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 selective breeding and anti methane vaccine. Whether that's going to be rolled out in 2028 as MLA is expecting to, or um, any any other technologies. Um, I think there is a clear um, there is a clear way to to incorporate more than one solution to your organisation, and that's kind of the approach that we selected that, that, that we took for the for the pathway. So incorporating a, a little bit of methane reduction from selective breeding and improved practices um, from your um, cattle, but also um, um, improving land management and, and land use change as well. So there's a little bit of a, a, a different options um, to to um, to reduce those emissions, I guess. And so, um, yeah, completely agree with you. All right. Um, now I've got another one here from the Med Shuttle. It relates more or less to managing the bushfire risk, I think, but it's about closing off areas of farm for re regeneration and the pastures uh, will consequently grow creating fire risk is there any guidance on how you manage that risk i mean is grazing available or what's the situation does andrew maybe have an answer to that what's happened andrew are you there andrew Ranger. I'm sorry, computer breakdown. No, you're right. Computer froze. Uh, um, the, in, in the C plus B pilot, you need to exclude grazing in the earlier years of growth to protect the plantings. Beyond then, you can graze the site for such things as, uh, as fire risk to reduce the fuel load within the plantings, absolutely. Um, you can do other things, of course, in relation to plantings. You can have fire breaks around them and those sorts of things. Uh, but again, it's like kind of a bit, a bit like in relation to drought. There's always a risk with 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 growing anything in the Australian landscape that it could be affected by disturbance events, and fire is one of them. As we've seen uh, with the 2019-2020 fires, when fire conditions get get severe, high winds, high high heat, low humidity. Um, then even with low amounts on biomass, it's very clear now that those areas can burn and so they and they can burn badly. Um, so there is a risk with your plantings that they, they could be lost and the you know, farmers need to be again aware of that and to the extent possible, um, try and control fuel loads in, in areas that could adversely affect the plantings. Very good. Now I have a, a question from Graham Anderson. Uh, and hello to you, Graham, today. Um, carbon sequestration is a great thing when applied in context. Any carbon income stream occurs whilst the site is still accumulating carbon, but in some future date that will slow and eventually hit a maximum limit per hectare. For next gen farmers, what might be their income options for that land then? Is it basically land retirement? It's a key issue for farmers thinking about land use options for the next generation and the risk of, from carbon offsets. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that, and that comment's 100% right. Sorry, Miguel, if, I, if you're going to jump in there. Yeah, I mean, basically, any if you're getting carbon in relation to the sequestration of anything, that system will reach an equilibrium. You've stalled, Andrew. So it's not a forever sort of thing, any carbon, or get money for it. Sorry, things stopped. 
No, oh, you're going God. again now. You're going again going now. Again. Yep, apologies. Um, I, I was just going to say the other thing to note is that under the ERF, and it's not dissimilar under other carbon programs, um, you, your crediting periods are also limited. So for a sequestration project, they're 25 years. That can be extended at some date in the future, but at the moment they're set at 25 years. Anyone who knows anything about tree growth will tell you that after 25 years, the forest has not got, in, not got anywhere near its maximum on-site biomass. It's usually around 40 to 60%, depending on the forest type and the conditions. Um, so you, you, you do actually at the moment get docked and you don't get full credit for, for fully restoring sites. But in terms of that, you know, what next? What land use options? And, and can you get revenue from those sites? The, the thing that you need to look for there is the potential to, um, to get money for biodiversity is what I'd be suggesting. That in those sites that you restore, that you try and get payments for uh, the biodiversity paying for and the sort of thing that in New South Wales, the Biodiversity Conservation Trust pays for. Um, that kind of the, the next option uh, perspective, is there always going to be someone out there who's willing to pay you on an annual basis for these areas? Uh, and, and again, it comes to that, there's back to that business planning. Um, there's a chance that there's not going to be someone there. And as a consequence, uh, I would be, if I was a, a farmer running a farm, looking to, to fit the plantings in, in a way that that fits with the broader business and, and the expectation that it might be that the revenue stream that comes from those land areas over the next 10 to 25 years might be a forever payment. And Andrew, did you want to add anything, Miguel? No, I think I just got it up pretty well. Yes. Got it all. Right. <laughs> uh, well, we might have one for you, for Miguel now. Um, Graham Strong has asked, who is paying for these projects? I'm not sure I understand how they reduce emissions. What's the mechanism for example, with farm carbon projects and displacing fossil fuel use? My understanding is that carbon sequestration projects were a feature of the cap and trade schemes. Have you got anything on that? Yeah, sure. So, so it's essentially, um, so um, talking about the emission reduction fund, you could get a contract with the federal government so that so you can get those Australian carbon credit units paid from the from the government. Um, there's also so you you go on a, on, on a contract with with them and that based on, on how you how the accus or the Australian carbon credit units are generated, then you surrender those to to the clean energy regulator and then you get and you get the, the payment uh, for those units. Uh, there's other there's another option about um, voluntary markets that is currently emerging where you have uh, most of the corporates, mining industries and a few other organizations looking for um, carbon offsets uh, and you can get onto, you can instead of surrender those of getting in, in, in a, under contract with the, with the Australian government, um, you can trade those as a, as a secondary market with these corporates looking to reduce their carbon footprint based on uh, their agenda and commitments. Um, that would be my, my answer. Um, Andrew, is that, did I miss anything? Yeah. Thanks, Miguel. Did you want to add anything, Andrew? No, no, no. Oh, Thanks, all right. Um, well, sort of on that system as well, Bob Davey has asked, as the carbon market in Australia is a free enterprise system, can you go through a voluntary carbon scheme other than the ERF, uh, Miguel, or maybe Yes, you can in short, you can. Uh, you can, there's, there's a number of other voluntary certification schemes that are out there, gold standard, um, really the network, there's a number of them that are out there. Probably gold standard and VCS, the most well known. There are a number that are, that are emerging. Um, the, the biggest issue you should be aware of there is, or the biggest question you should be asking is who's going to buy my credits? At the moment in Australia, the, the two overwhelming dominant credit types that are being bought uh, are ACU, the Australian Carbon Credit Units generated under the ERF, uh, and then um, certified emission reductions under the old Kyoto Protocols uh, clean development mechanism. They completely dominate the market. 
there is one gold standard project in Western Australia and there's three now dormant VCS projects that are in Tasmania that were transitioned over to the ERF. So effectively there's one of those other VCS gold standard projects, but there are some regional network projects out there and uh, um, probably people know a bit about them. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, here's an interesting one from Carmel McHugh McCallum. Do indigenous cultural methods get factored into any of these processes? Probably one for Andrew or maybe Miguel. Yeah, uh, the, the Land Restoration Fund in Queensland has, as I understand it, has uh, co-benefits related to indigenous issues. So um, they, they have a process for that. Um, I don't, the, the Western Australian government is, is running a, a Land Restoration Fund equivalent right now. I'm not sure the way that they're approaching Indigenous co-benefits. Uh, and I think there's some work going on. I know there's some work going on in Victoria as well, and, I, and I'm not fully across it. In our programs at the moment, no, we don't. We don't have a, a process for, for co-benefits to be assessed in relation to Indigenous issues, whether they be cultural or social. Um, it, it's something that I'm, I'm keen to work on. I think in relation to those, those issues, there, there needs to be processes to make sure that those, those claims are, uh, are credible and to ensure that the Indigenous communities don't have any of their interests appropriated by others inappropriately. Uh, thanks very much. Um, all right. Thank you, uh, Andrew and Miguel. It's been a very interesting talk on a quite complicated issue, so hopefully we'll see more of it. Um, there are a lot more questions, um, but we haven't got time for those just at the moment. Uh, we'll throw to Emily, who will give you a uh, quick um, spiel on what FCA's program for the future is and what we're planning to do. Um, and have we got time, if, if Andrew and Miguel, have you got to go or could we spend another five or 10 minutes on questions or what do you want to do? I've got about another five minutes or so. Five minutes. Um, All right. No, we'll, no, that's, that's fair enough. Um, we'll we'll uh, throw to Emily and then I shall wrap the proceedings up. Thank you very much. Emily. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emily, Farmers for Climate Actions Community Organising Manager. Thanks so much to our speakers today for a really good session. And it's great to see so many of you here tuning in from right across the country. Um, as you all know, these are really important issues that we're dealing with, so it's fantastic that you could all make it today. Now that we've heard all about the pathway to reducing emissions in ag and the opportunities for farmers in reducing emissions, we really need to make sure that our politicians hear about it too. So currently we're at a really critical juncture in Australia's climate policy. The federal nationals have been a key blocker on climate action for so long now, but the pressure on them to move on climate action right now is enormous. I don't know if many of you would have heard about this, but the news out of New South Wales this morning with John Barillaro getting behind a 50% emissions reductions target for New South Wales by 2030 is huge. And the Victorian Nats have been pushing incredibly hard for federal climate action as well. So now, more than ever, we have a real chance to get some strong political leadership on these issues and to make sure our politicians do what's needed to secure Australia's farming future. Farmers in particular, as many of you know, are such a powerful voice in Australian politics. You know, studies show farmers are one of the most trusted voices on climate and farmers are a key constituent group for the Nats. So we really need to hear your voice on these issues right now. Um, so Farmers for Climate Action will be pushing out a few key messages over the next few months related to what we've just been talking about. So one of them is that farming families can diversify their incomes, increase their productivity and profit from good, uh, good climate policy. Farming families do not want to miss the opportunities climate action presents for them. And agriculture can easily achieve a net zero outcome by 2040 but we need the federal Nats to follow the New South Wales government's lead and support deep emissions cuts to energy and transport this decade to protect Australia's farming families. We can't push these messages alone. We need really as many farmers as we can get asking for these things and to get those messages heard by our federal politicians. So here are three things that we'd love you to do to get those messages across. 
The first thing is writing a letter to the editor in your local newspaper. It might sound old fashioned to some, but it's one of the most powerful things you can do. You'll reach a large local audience and that really puts pressure on your local MPs to act. Um, letters, letters, uh, letters to the editor are also really quick and easy to write. So remember to keep it brief, keep it personal, you know, about who you are as a farmer and why you care about climate action and make sure you're really clear about what you're asking your local MP to do. We also would love you to sign our open letter. So today we're going to have an open letter going out thanking the New South Wales government for showing leadership in supporting bold climate targets and asking federal Nats to follow their example and do the same. So we'll send you an email today where you can sign that open letter. So please look out for it. And we'll be taking a copy of the signed letter to rural MPs in New South Wales and getting a heap of local media coverage around it. So the more farmers we have signing this letter, the more powerful it will be. So please do that. It'll take you about two minutes. The third thing you can do is writing a letter or an email to your local MP. So as one of their constituents, your opinion holds a lot of weight. So, you know, start the letter by telling your MP who you are, why you're writing to them, you know, make it clear at the start of the letter what you're asking them to do. So in your opening sentence as well, like I said, very much mention that you're a constituent and also a farmer because this will make the MP way more likely to listen to you. And if you like, you can attach a link to our report, um, basically outlining the pathway forward for ag in a low emissions future. So in all of this, it's so important to frame your message around the opportunities that acting on climate will provide for regional Australia. So frame your email about not wanting to miss out on the long-term regional jobs, productivity, manufacturing, industry, and just general opportunities that climate action will provide. You know, Barnaby Joyce often says that climate action costs regional Australia jobs and money, so we need to counter that in our messages and bring today's events into it. You know, the New South Wales and Victorian Nats are getting behind strong climate action, so why aren't you? Um, in summary, <laughs> please do whatever you can over the next couple of days to get your message out there to your local MP, whether that's writing a letter to the editor, signing our open letter, or writing to your MP. And if you can do all of the above, that would be fantastic. You know, right now we have a real chance to get some strong climate policies from our federal politicians that really benefit farmers. So we've got to do everything we can to make sure that happens. If you need any help with doing any of this, please get in touch and, and we can help you write that letter to the editor or your letter to the MP. Thanks, back to you, Peter. Thanks, Emily. And I'd just like to uh, wrap up by saying thank you to Miguel. Joshua and Andrew, it's been a very informative um, discussion today. I'm sure there's heaps more questions that we could spend time on, but um, hopefully uh, we'll get some action and hopefully the rollout of the C&B program will be of great benefit to farmer communities around Australia. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I'll close the webinar. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Miguel, Andrew, and Josh and Emily. Thanks.